Welcome everybody. Uh, it's great to see everybody again. Uh, it's great to have some new faces here. Um, I'm excited for tonight. Uh, this week has been an uncomfortable week and I'd like to say thank you to Michaela for her prayers for that. Okay, it's like, I'm just letting you know that I'm, I'm praying for you that you're uncomfortable and that like, that God just continues. It's, it's a good thing to be uncomfortable. I hate being comfortable. It's like everything's going all right. I'm good, but it's just like, ah, I want more. I want more of him. I want to pursue him more than I ever had. And when you're uncomfortable, ooh, you really start to pursue him. You really start to see more depths and the layers that he's made of. And it's such a beautiful thing to just pursue him and be uncomfortable at times. So let me just pray before we get into tonight. God, I just thank you so much that you brought us out here again on a Friday night, Lord. Um, we're just so, we're so thankful for you. So thankful for what you've done in our lives, for what you're continuing to do in our lives, the things that you have in the future. God, we just come here and we just honor you and we glorify you and we just give you praise because you're worthy of it. God, we ask that any word that is spoken today, God, that it would be all you. That every single word that comes out of my mouth, Lord, would be you. It wouldn't be me. That you would crush everything that Dustin has to say tonight and that you would just speak and use me as a vessel, Lord, to speak whatever you so want. God, we ask that you open up the hearts and the minds of the people that are here that we're able to uh, comprehend the word that you bring forth today. And that we just keep an open heart and an open mind through everything that you're trying to say to us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So as I was saying, this week has been uh, an uncomfortable week. But it's just been a week where I've really pursued God more than I ever had, except for probably like the first week as I was a believer. First week I was a believer, it was just like reading the Bible like three hours a day and just couldn't even put the thing down. Just was so just in love with this God and how amazing that He is. And this week, He, he got me off that comfortability a little bit. He jolted me a little and said, come on, pursue me more. Pursue me more. And I was able to do that. And it probably wasn't up until we started worship where I finally felt like an ease come over me. And it was just like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. He's such a great Father. He's such a loving Father. He loves us more than anyone could ever love us. I said this, that every single person in this whole entire world can hate you but you will still have enough love because of how much He offers. It doesn't matter how many people don't like you or dislike you or are mean to you because His love overpowers all of that. It, it just, it crushes all of that. Speaking of love, this series that we've been going through is called You Complete Me. And it's about love, sex, and relationships. And I had spoke about this series in the first night that I really felt like this would be one of those series where if you've ever been to like a sporting event and they have the noise meter up there on the board and they're trying to get everybody to like, come on, get loud, get loud, get loud, get loud. And then that pendulum just kind of swings and swings and swings and then it bursts through the top of it. Kind of felt like that that's the route the Lord was heading through this series. Not in like number wise, but what he was doing growth wise in here. Because this is where the growth is. Everything that we have, it, all the growth is in here. The things that come on the outside, sometimes they come along with the growth that comes in here. But we don't chase what's on the outside. We just keep chasing for what's on the inside. We keep pursuing that hunger to want to want him to be seen through us. To want to die to ourselves every day so that he's just seen more and more through us. The first night we talked about the first ever relationship that the world has ever seen. And most of us know Adam and Eve. 
first ever relationship that ever came about that, that all religions and all people across the world have heard about Adam and Eve. We believe that that story is directly through our God. But what happened was God had made all the heavens and the earth. He had made everything, the trees and the creatures, the ground. He separated the water from the sky. He made everything. And mankind was part of that. And he said, God, the Bible says that God made it all, and he said that it was very good. He looked at it and just said, oh, this is good stuff right here. This is awesome. <coughs> Do you see what I made? There's no one here. It's just me, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, intrinsically working together, all one God, but with three different labors and divisions, but still one God. And he makes Adam, his first ever person that he makes, and he puts Adam in the garden of Eden to work in the garden by himself with God and build this relationship with God. That's all that Adam did. He worked in this garden and built a relationship with the Lord. Eve wasn't even around. It was just Adam. It was just Adam just digging in, pouring in, trying to find more about this creator that made me. They were inseparable. There was no sin. It didn't even exist. And Adam just lived in this garden with God, talked to her, and walked with her. How amazing would it have been? To us, when we look back and we say, wow, that would have been amazing. But to Adam, he said, this is just the way that it is, I guess. That's what I desire to get back to. That we just walk in the garden like this is just the way that it is, right? And that we can ignore everything that the world has out there. And that we can walk in the garden just like Adam and Eve did. Just the way that it is, right? After Adam had pursued God. And after Adam had consistently made this relationship with the Lord. Then God looked at him and says, okay, this is not good. He needs a helper suitable for him. The Bible says that he put Adam to sleep. And most translations say that he took Adam's rib. But that word in the Greek is to sell it. And the word to sell it means side. That God literally took Adam's whole side to create Eve. Adam goes, now I have someone that's bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, not my rib. We could assume that Eve was created halfway down of Adam and made that it would be perfectly suitable for Adam. Here's the thing. God didn't put Adam and Eve in the garden together in the beginning because God knew that if he put Eve at the same time Adam in the garden, then Adam would never have a relationship with the Lord and he would just start focusing on Eve. He said, no, no. She's not, she's not going to come yet because you need, I need you. I need all of you. I need to create you into the man of God that I've called you to be. And then I will bring the woman to you. Yeah, the Bible doesn't say that Adam ran out of the garden. It doesn't say that he ran around the garden looking for her. It says that God placed the woman right there in front of him. God loves his daughters. He loves them just as much as he loves his sons. But he loves them so much that he would never put them into the hands of a man that wasn't worthy to treat them the right way. It's not the type of God. Sometimes we could do it on our own, but God would never bring a woman to a man that wasn't fit to take her, that wasn't fit to handle her, that wasn't fit to love her and cover her and protect her. Bible Zen says that Adam and Eve basically looked at each other and it says that they were naked and they felt no shame. And we look at this and we say, wow, they were naked. All right, that's, that's what it was back then. They didn't really wear clothes or anything like that. They just walked around the garden, strutting around naked all day long. But when we look at this, they looked at each other and they had no shame. And what, what I feel God was saying right here was, they had no shame as they entered into the relationship. They didn't bring any type of baggage into the relationship. 
There was no mom issues or dad issues. There was no rejection issues or depression issues or addiction problems or lonely problems. They were pure. They had worked in the garden with the Lord. And then God brought them together so that they were naked and had no shame. So what, what's the issues in, in your life, Adam? What's the issues in your life, Eve? Oh, I don't, don't have any. God created a relationship to be that we would walk side by side. That's why Eve was taken out of Adam's side and not the front of him, so that they would walk side by side and serve the Lord together. That's what our partner will always be. Someone to walk side by side with. We talked about last week how much love God has. How that we can be separated from God, but we can't be separated from His love. That's how deep His love really goes. That we can choose to say, God, I don't want you, and I'm walking away. And we can be separated from Him. But His love never stops. His love is so deep. His love, we cannot even reach the surface of His love. It's, it's just beyond comprehension to even understand what it really means that God loves us that much. It's so, we can't, we're not big enough. We're not smart enough. We don't, we're, not, we're not intelligent enough to wrap our brains around the love of the Father and how deep that it really is. Paul goes into this letter, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter in the Bible. And he says, love is patient. Love is kind. Love holds no records of wrongs. It, it doesn't envy. It does not boast. It, it loves all things. It, it endures all things. We, we love those who persecute us. Because what good is it if we only love the ones that love us? This is in Matthew But we've talked about how the world has completely taken love, sex, and relationships and have done a whole 360, a whole 189, and it's going the complete opposite way. Hollywood, in our upbringing, has formed us and molded us and shaped us into thinking what love, sex, and relationships actually means. Pick a website, pick a TV show, pick a movie. There's a love story. There's sex in, in all the sitcoms out today. There's TV shows where, where there's relationships on and on and on and on. And it, and, it, and it translates to us of like, wow, as young kids, that's how a relationship is. That's, that's how it works. Or our upbringing that we go around, that's how mommy and daddy have a relationship. So... I, I guess that that's what I go into a relationship for. And even if we disagree that our relationship is like that, there's parts of it that are. We can't, we can't avoid it. Since the beginning of time, the world, the enemy has shaped and molded love, sex, and relationships along with everything else. But I would say that love, sex, and relationships is by far the most primary topic that Christians have to deal with today. This is big. This is, this is everything right here. We've got to get this. It starts with the men, though. I'm going to go into that. God designed that men would lead. God designed that men would cover their women and that they would protect their women. That they would be a tree in that garden to cover them and protect the gentle creature that God created them to be. That's why every evil who got a rose in here tonight because you were precious and God loves you more than anyone could ever tell you that he loves you. If you didn't get a rose, We'll do a bouquet of at the end of the one of them. But the love of the Father is so deep for his daughters. 
where things spiral out ever since the first sin. And people say, well, no, 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 Eve took the fruit, man. Eve took the forbidden fruit off the tree. She's the one that did it. But what we don't see is Adam stood right there and watched her do it and just said, I guess, honey. What Adam should have done was said, honey, you know God told us not to eat from this tree. I love you. But before we do this, why don't we just check really quickly with our Creator to see if we should take a bite out of this. Just to be sure. Let's check with our covering. That didn't happen though. Adam just stood there. And then God said, what'd you guys do? She did it. And then she goes, Satan did it. I didn't do nothing. It was all him. It was all him. It was all him. But it all spirals back from Adam of standing there just saying, yeah, let's do it. Men, we have a choice to step up and be men of God. We have a choice. No one is going to force us to do anything. So in honor of talking to the men tonight, I want all the men here, doesn't matter what kind of bark you got, but on the count of three, I want you to make your, your dog bark. All right? One, two, three. <laughs> and that is exactly why we need to have this message tonight. There's a trick. A trick here. The world has molded us in our minds into what is a man. I know that we all grew up around different homes and different structures, but I know in my upbringing, not having a father around and being involved in school, that was the thing. It was like, let's go. See the girl over there. That's all that it was. That's all that it was. The world says we need to have a career, right? The, the, the world says, men, you guys need to have a career. You need to make money and you need to provide. you got to have one. The world says you can't show any emotion, men. You need to be strong and tough. Because people on the catalogs are strong and tough. And the world is painted and men got to be strong. But we can't cry. And that's why I loved how Charlie brought that up while he was speaking tonight. Because I have cried so many times. I grew up watching Lifetime movies with my mom. We cried all the time. No way it is. <laughs> Lifetime is real. You want to cry? Go watch a Lifetime movie. We can cry. Matter of fact, if you don't cry, Hold it again. Charlie was saying. But that's what the world is portrayed. You, you can't cry. You're a man. Come on, man. Especially when you got a group of buddies that would make fun of you if you did it. I love it when I see a man cry. I love it. Because I just see the joy. And I see how, how much of faith that it takes to take a step and say, I'm not ashamed to cry. I'm not ashamed of it. It's okay, I can cry. I cried in motion. I'll cry later. Because of how deep God's love is. Because how much that He really loves us that much that sometimes we just cry. There's healing in tears. There's healing in it. From the first time that I had an encounter with God, I think I cried for about 40 minutes straight and I could not even stop it. I couldn't. I tried to. I was like, no, no, no. Couldn't do it. Try to stop the creator of the universe. There's galaxies upon galaxies out there. There's billions of stars. There's billions of planets out there that we can't even reach them. with our fancy technology as it is today. We can't even come close to it. That's how big our God is. To try to stop him and fight him. Oh, he'll make you cry like a baby. And I love it. The world says that we need to disrespect women. Make me a sandwich. I had a long day. Where's my dinner? You turn on the TV. That's the way it is. 
Honey, I'm home. Where's my dinner? Feet reclined, got my beer, turn on the tube, watch TV. This is what they've painted and molded us growing up. And for a while, that's what I did. Hey, you bring any food home? I had a long day. You haven't got off the couch in eight hours. I was betting on sports for my job. That's what I did. I hear so much out there in the world of men complaining about their spouses or men complaining about their girlfriends or just men complaining about women in general. Oh, she just all oh, this wrong. Like that's the picture that they painted out there. That it's okay to just talk about your wife. Yeah, man, my wife, she's crazy, man. She's just crazy. I waited tables in Texas. I don't know how many times the wife would go to the bathroom and the husband would go, you'll never get married. All the time. She's nuts. Why are you married to her? I need her. She's crazy, though. You got a thing strong over there, man. She passed out early on me. Like, I just can't do that, sir. I'm sorry. Dude, there's this crazy guy over there. But the funny thing is, when I was in the world, I was just like, yeah, I know, right? I got girls, too. Man, they're all crazy, man. They're crazy. What happened to honoring our woman? What happened to laying down our life for our woman? What happened to that? Because that's the way that the Bible sees it, that we would lay down our lives for the woman. That we would shelter them, that we would take care of them, that we would cover them. That we would walk with them side by side and never let anything come out against them. You see, when Jesus, Jesus protects us from the enemy. And he gets his direct relation from God the Father, God the Father, God the Son. He's protected from the enemy because of God the Father. The women are protected from the enemy because of the man of their life. Not all the time, but it's, but it's designed. And it doesn't mean that a man is any better than a woman. The Godhead, which is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all work together as one. That's what they do. They work together as one. And it translates right into the home, where you have the father, the mother, and the children all flowing together as one. None of them are better than the other. We model our church, we model our homes off of the Godhead that there's different positions and there's different orders and there's different coverings where everybody is still on one equal level with different roles. The world says we got to have a backyard and a barbecue and a beer to mow the lawn with. Yeah. Today we gotta have a little smartphone too that we can watch the game while we're doing it. We mess up the whole lawn. <laughs> we're watching the Little League World Series the other day. Charlie's like, I gotta go out and mow the lawn. Man, you can't miss this game. It's Japan versus Mexico. I finish. I'll do one line and get back in there. I'm texting one like, it's still zero zero. Okay, it's 17 to 15. What? I missed the whole game, man. The lawn looks terrible. <laughs> the world says we gotta have a nice car. We gotta have a motorcycle. Because we're a man. And we look good on a bike. We look good in a car. If we're a sporty guy, and we have like a two-door coupe, and like the Honda Accords, we got like a Honda Civic, we got the two doors, we got some bass in the back. You know, bumping down the highway. Right, Sean? Right here. Bumping down the highway. Got my bass real low. We're sporty. We rock, you know, a Nike t-shirt. We're always at the gym. That's the sporty guy. I got a little sporty guy in me. But then you got a country guy. I'll never drive a car. Cars for women. I drive a truck. Cause I'm a man and I wear my boots to bed. I don't take them off. I always have my boots on. The mountains are cold and I must go. <laughs> Got mud flaps on the back because I was off roading the other day. Cause I'm country and I don't chew 
gum, I chew tobacco. And I don't have a cigarette, I got a straw in my mouth. Because I'm a country. And that is the way that I am because I'm a man. I remember in Texas, I was nothing, I've never been country before, but they had this place called the Wild West. This is way before I believed in Jesus. And <laughs> this is where like all the nice country girls would go to the Wild West. And I was like, I'm going with that, but I gotta find an attire. I went out and bought some boots, I went out and bought a hat, went in there with some tight jeans, was like, yeah, how you doing? Yeehaw, right? Like, this guy. You could just tell that I just looked awkward in it. But I was pulling the card on some of them. Yeah, I, my daddy owns a farm back in upstate New York. <laughs> I'm just visiting. Then they saw me start two stepping. They're like, Yeah, you're definitely not country. Get out of the bar. Man, I almost pulled it off. You got the classic guy. They, they always have like a four door car. They don't need two door, four door. This looks professional. Got to have a Lexus or a Mercedes. It's got to be real clean. It's got to be new. Leather. They always wear a tie. They don't even have anything to do with it, but they're wearing a tie. Tacos. I'm in business. I'm an entrepreneur. Yeah. They go to all the fancy restaurants. They order a bottle of wine. I remember I tried to do that one time. I brought a girl out to fancy place and I'm just like, she's like, so what kind of wine do you like? Whatever you like. I don't know anything about wine. I didn't tell her that. I was like, bring me your best wine. Do that I know that a best bottle of wine could cost you like 500 bucks. We'll see. Don't ever go to a restaurant over the day and say, just give me your best wine. Unless you're Donald Trump. Don't do it. On their days off, they have khaki Khaki shorts with a polo and spares. That's their that's their look. The days off, kind of look. The world says that you got to be crafty to get by, but I promise you that you will eventually get caught, and it will catch up to you. Right? Oh man, did I think that I had so much wisdom when I lived in the world? Because I sold cars and I was able to sell a bad car to someone to make a lot of money. Because that's the way the world painted it. And I'm like, oh, man, I can do this. I'm good at this. The world, you have to be crafty. You have to be smart. You have to be able to, to con someone or have to be a good mouthpiece. Nothing but a fool. Eventually it comes back to you. Well, I was down on my hands and knees, not knowing what else to do or where else to turn. All my craftiness didn't look anything like it. Yeah, I was crafty for about three years. That's why you hear those people too. You, your buddies, your your girls, your guys, whatever. Oh, I'm doing good, man. I made 300k last year. And pumped up. I, I did this. I did this. I remember coming home, and someone told me they said, "So, what are you doing now? Where you know where do you work?" She's like, oh, I'm paralegal at a law firm. Like, what do you make? She's like, make like 10 bucks an hour, get a bonus. I make a little bit more than that now. But at the time, it's all I was making. And they're like, really? Like, they have this vision of like, you're with God. He's not taking care of you. Dude, I got like 10 grand in the bank. A month later, that same person we went out to dinner, they didn't have money to pay for. comes and goes, comes and goes. But my bank account never got small because the wisdom that the Lord's put, I take care of my money, I'm frugal with my money. Money doesn't mean anything, but I do take care of it. And I'm just fling it around everywhere. Like most people that will tell you, yeah, I make plenty of money, man. That's the way that the world says a man should be. I got possessions, I make money, I'm a man. you are probably one of the highest things that a man of God can walk with is his integrity and his word. His integrity is everything. When you meet a man that says something and every single time that he says that it happens, bam, right there, that's a man of God. 
There was mistakes that people made in the Old Testament and because they made a vow, because they said that they would do it, they did it anyway. Because they felt like their word was all that they had. Their word was everything. Word of a generation where commitment means nothing. You don't have to commit to anything. It's a maybe all day long. And that's fine. If you don't know, be a maybe. But when you say yes, you've really made up your mind. As a man of God, you've got to hold through with that. The world says you've got to have a lot of possessions so you can show how far we've made it in life. The sad thing is some of us have a better relationship with this than we do the Lord. Some of us have a better relationship with this than the people that are around us, that love us, our families, our brothers, our sisters, our girlfriends, our boyfriends, our wives, our husbands. We have a better relationship with this than we do with that. The world says chivalry is dead. Put the seat down. Open the door for the lady. Make sure you say your pleases and your thank yous all the time. When I was a kid growing up, my mom forced me to say please and thank you. If I didn't say thank you, she made me like, she would drive me to somebody's house and say, you know, I'll go in there and say thank you. Mom, you're driving me all the way here because I forgot to say thank you? I'll never forget it. Please and thank you. Thank you so much. You first. Ladies first. Always ladies first. As a man of God, we've got to keep chivalry alive. I'm not saying that all of these things are wrong to have, but I am saying to make sure that the Lord is first before all of them. Because what happens is we get going and we say, I just need to get this career ready to go, and then I'm just going to pour into God. I just need to get this in order and this in order, and then I'll spend time with the Lord. And the Lord's like, I want to be your rock. I want to be your foundation. I want you to put me before everything and watch to see what happens. There was a man named Solomon in the Bible. Solomon was King David's son. The Bible talks about King David. King David was the greatest king ever. He was a man after God's own heart. He pursued the Lord. He was a warrior. He was a poet. He was a man of God like you've never seen before. Jesus even said, he said, I'm son of David. To even give someone that name right there. But Jesus said, I'm a son of David. Because David was in that line, in that descended line. And David had in his heart to build this big palace and this big temple for God. He wanted to do it. And then God came to him and said, you're not going to be the one that does it. Your son, Solomon, is going to be the one that builds the big temple. So David calls in everybody in all Israel. And he calls in all the commanders and the officials and the people that are in control of the army and everybody out there. Anyone that's in a higher leader standard position in Israel. He called them in and he said, I've got to let you guys know that my son Solomon will be the king. He's the next to take the throne. And he will build my father's house. He will build the house of God. And Solomon is put forth everyone and he's the new king now. Solomon's young. The shoes that he's got to walk in, the shadow that he's got to walk in after King David, the best king that you've ever seen, the glory, glory king everyone talks about, King David. And Solomon is, he's, he's shaking about this. And he sacrifices all these things as an offering to the Lord. Thank you so much God for allowing me to be king. And then God comes to Solomon and he says Solomon, I'm going to give you one request and whatever it is, I will grant it to you. And because Solomon had a heart that says, I will lay down my life for my people. Because Solomon had a heart that said them before me. Because Solomon had a heart that it was so important that the people around him were doing well before him. He asked God, give me wisdom to take care of your people. Give me wisdom, God. Out of everything that he could have picked, he said, God, give me wisdom because I don't want to fail.
fail you. God, give me wisdom because I want to take care of your people. I want to lay down my life for them and I want to make sure that I'm doing it the right way. I want to be that shepherd. I don't want to make any mistakes. Please, God, I look at these people and I care so much about them. That's what a man of God says. I'm laying down my life for my people. I care about them before me. They need to be taken care of. I've got to be that strong person in their life. Solomon ended up ruling from the Euphrates River to Egypt. In modern day time, this would be a part of parts of Egypt and Iraq, all of Jordan, all of Syria, and all of Lebanon, and all of Israel. This is how much land that Solomon was really in control of and in charge of. Can you imagine? Six countries right there. And everything was on his shoulders. Everything was on him. And he builds the house of God that you could only dream of. The Bible says that there is 8.1 million pounds of gold built in this house. 76.2 million pounds of silver, metals, bronze, ivory, and cedar wood all filled in this house. Can you imagine walking to a place that has 8.1 million pounds of gold? This whole place would just be gold. Oh my gosh. Picture just walking in and seeing this gold everywhere. If we take the rate of gold, Today, it's worth $133 trillion. Can you that at all? $133 trillion. That's just gold alone of how much this would have been worth in today. He had 12,000 horses, and he had 1,400 chariots. He had apes and baboons. He had vineyards and gardens and pools where he, his own wine would just flow up. He had everything. Everything a man could ever think of. He had male and female slaves. He had singers. He had dancers. He had musicians. Us out there, us men that are out there trying to chase that buck, oh, I'm getting into this right now because it's not worth it. The Bible says that he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Oh my gosh. That's it, right? 700 wives? Are you crazy? A concubine was someone that was a little bit less than the wife. Usually used in that time period to just reproduce. A thousand different women in his life. I pray to God every single day that I could just treat my wife with everything that I possibly have. And that's just one. Oh man. There's no way you could please a thousand women. That's impossible. I want to see the God. Maybe the Dos Equis God, but that's about it. Just kidding. Those commercials get me sometimes. Solomon had everything that he ever wanted. Everything that you could think of. All the possessions that he could ever want. People would visit him just to hear the wisdom that he had. Out of the whole entire world, Solomon had the greatest wisdom that the world has ever seen. And until Jesus came, he had more wisdom. But other than Jesus, Solomon had the wisdom that no one had. Had the intellect, had the intelligence, had the understanding and the comprehension of everything. And his downfall was women. And this is the topic that we've got to talk a little bit right now. I want to get into sex, and I want to talk about pornography, because it is a bad thing. Things that pornography does to a man, for one, you will never be able to love the person that is there in front of you as much as God intended you to love that person because of all the other women that you've been seeing. The Bible says that even if you so lust after a woman in your heart that you've already committed adultery, how deep that really goes. You will never be satisfied with the woman that's right in front of you because you've been seeing 
hundreds and thousands of them every single day in this type of poverty. It's bad. It's got to go. It's got to be gone. He said, well, it's only hurting me. It's only hurting me. The Bible says that our body is a temple. And let me tell you, the moment that you even come close to something like that, Satan walks right into your life. And he doesn't just mess up your sexual part of your life. He messes up everything. You give him complete control into your life. And he can do whatever he wants with it. Because you opened up the door for him the moment that you clicked on something. You opened it up. It's not hurting anyone else, right? Anyone like coffee here? Anyone like Starbucks coffee? <laughs> Imagine that no one in the whole entire world drank coffee. How many Starbucks would be up right now? None. Even if a few people drank coffee. A couple thousand. You wouldn't have many Starbucks. You wouldn't have many people selling Folgers. There wouldn't be much coffee in store. There'd be none of that. It's all supply and demand. If the people demand it, then the companies will supply it. That's how pornography works. Every time you click on something, you are funding that website to keep running. The more clicks that that website has, the more money they get from advertisers to put on their websites. You fund it. Even deeper, women trafficking is directly related to this as well. We fund women trafficking every time that we support this, every time that we click on this. If there was no guys out here, or anyone across the world, they didn't click on pornography, then there would be no business for it. Men would not be kidnapping women across the world to bring them into something like this. Pornography websites would not be existent on the websites. They would be gone because there would be no money to make it in. So when we click on those things, we are supplying those companies and supplying and encouraging them to go out and do this. No women would ever fall into something like this if we didn't support it. All it takes is a click and we're supporting it. And I'm not going to stand up here and act like I wasn't part of my old life because it was. It's hard. You know, it's hard. I won't be a church that just doesn't talk about that. I put something behind the doors. I'm not talking about it. But I'm talking about it. That's my take on it. Solomon told... God told Solomon, don't mate with the other women. Don't mate with the foreign women is what he told Solomon. The foreign women, I guess, in today's standards would be someone who doesn't believe. That's what, that's what he told Solomon. Because their perspective is here and your perspective is here. And they're going to drag you into some things that you don't want to do. And if Solomon, the man with the greatest wisdom in all the world, he didn't have enough strength and wisdom to stay out of serving these women that brought in their false gods to his life. And we certainly don't have the strength or the wisdom to be around him either, either. Solomon's fall happened because of that. The women, the foreign women, would worship these false gods and he would allow their false gods to be there making sacrifices right in front of him. And when God says, saw this, he's like, look, man, I got to go. I can't be around this. I'm not, I'm not here. This is your choice that you're making right now, Solomon. And I'm just going to stand inside because I got nothing to do with this. False God can be anything today. It's idolatry. Your phone could be a false God. Your phone could be idolatry if you have a deeper relationship with this than you do with the Lord. So many video games. Computer, Facebook, movies. We got a movie watchers in here. Where's your heart? But where is your heart? After this happened, Solomon had adversaries from every single side that were trying to take him down. 
Because what happened? It's not that God said, now I'm going to go send some people in there to take you out. That's not God. Our own desires is what causes these things to fall. Our own decisions, our own choices, it was, is, is what allows the enemy to come into our life. So when Solomon made his own decision to do this, the enemy was just receptive to his life. He had his way with him. He had a field day. He had people from all over just trying to come at him and kill him. God had grace on him and mercy on him. During these troubled times, Solomon wrote what I believe is maybe my favorite book in the Bible. I don't know if I'm going to say this right, but I always say, Ecclesiastes. Anyone got a better one? Ecclesiastes? Maybe? Ecclesiastes? That's right. During this time, Solomon is going through terrible things. But then he comes back to the Lord. The Lord has grace on him. He doesn't take him off of his throne. And he lets him finish off his throne until he passes away. But during this time, when the grace of the Lord came on Solomon, and that he was able to stay on the throne, he wrote this just amazing book. I just want to read the first chapter here. He says, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they work hard under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and returns and blows to the north. Round and around it goes. Ever returning on its course, all streams flow into the sea. Yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of steam, nor the ear is filled with hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new? It was already here already, long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations, and even though yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. Solomon starts off this book with just writing how literally everything is just meaningless. After, go, after having everything, after having all the possessions that you could imagine, after having any type of woman that he could ever think or dream of, after having all the land that he could ever want, after having people bow to his knee, and gardens, and springs, and wine, and food, and people would visit him from all over the world just to hear his wisdom. He had gold bowls and gold silverware and a gold house. And he writes this book and says, none of it matter. He goes through this whole entire book talking about how pleasures are meaningless. Wisdom is meaningless. There's a time for everything. My hard work around the sun is just meaningless. Advancement in life, it's, it's just meaningless. Riches are meaningless. And he goes on and on and on about after him having everything. He says, just meaningless. And then he finishes the book and says, Now, all has been heard. Here's the conclusion of the matter. Worship God and keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. We take it from Solomon. This man had everything. And after having everything and falling and being back in the hands of the Lord because of how loving he is, because of how graceful he is, because of how much that he loves us and cares for us and has this personal relationship with us, none of it matters.
Jesus was gentle. He, he, he wounded people with his words. He, he was loving. When he saw someone crying, he just had mercy on them. He had so much sympathy on them. Please don't cry. He's always been this loving father. And as men today, this is who we should model our life after. We should look to Jesus and say, I want to be a man like that. Everything will eventually fade away. Things will come and they will go. But our God, our rock, our Jesus remains. You take it to God. To Him, always there with you. He never fails you. He loves you more than you could ever imagine. Because He has this great love for you. He takes care of us and He covers us. And he never lets us fail. that I went down without any type of father figure in my life, it just made so much sense. I haven't seen my father in 20 years. But because of the God that loves us so much, that cares so much about you, that he wants to be your dad, and then it's personal. And the things that happen in our lives are like, oh my gosh, God, how did you know? How could we be, how could there be this many people in the whole entire world? And for him to still have a personal relationship with each and every one of us. That's so amazing.